Hello everyone, welcome. This is World Building 101, panel number 13 here at Dork Tales Expo. Uh, so hi everybody, I'm Kelly. I'm going to be the moderator of this. Uh, welcome, this is my channel, Dork Tales, and um, I use he, him as my pronouns. I'm very excited to be here because world building is something that I love to do. A uh, quick backstory about myself. I'm a professional writer who does lots of world building in my day-to-day -day life. I also am a now former professor of visual storytelling where I had to teach people how to do this, which is kind of nice. Uh, love it. Uh, world building is honestly one of my favorite things and is the reason that I got a pointless degree. Well, not pointless. I got to hang out with, and talk, talk with Jen, so that was kind of nice. But um, yeah, I got an entire degree by accident studying for world building, so it's going to be fun. Uh, let's pass it around in a big circle. Robin. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I'm Robin. I use she, her, or they, them pronouns. You can find me at Second Gen Gamer on Twitch, but mostly here at Dork Tales. Um, I don't have many professional qualifications of writing or story building other than the fact that I just loved reading different fantasy setting and world books as a kid and loved creating my own little worlds and sometimes writing them down myself, um, which those are probably locked away by my parents somewhere. Um, but yeah, I, I love, I love creating worlds. Nice. All right. Hi, Mike. Hi, everyone. It's me, Michael, uh, going with he, him pronouns. And I have been a longtime role-playing gamer and creator. Uh, I do a lot of artwork now, but I used to do a lot of writing when I was younger. Uh, I actually have a huge binder sitting down beside me with multiple games that I've created over the years. And I'm kind of in a weird position now in the fact that I'm a real-world sign designer. Uh, for the last 17 years, I have been creating the world of the city that I live in. Uh, there's my artwork all over the place, drive past me on the way to work and uh, buildings and businesses and a lot of people hand out my business cards that I helped design. So I'm kind of coming at it from a weird angle in the fact that my world building is the actual world. So I'm happy to be here. Nice. All right, let's go down to Tasha. All right, I'm Natasha. You can find me here on Twitch and on the rest of the internet at Natasha Tuskovich Designs. Um, I love reading and writing fiction, and I love writing um, RPGs and especially kind of creating all the little details that go into an RPG world. <laughs> nice. All right, let's pass it to Jen. Uh, hi, I'm Jen. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and uh, you can basically find me here on Dork Tales. Um, I do... I, did some streaming before my you know house flooded and all of that fun stuff maybe i'll get back to it one day that would be nice i still have all the stuff so but i'd like to be you know somewhere stable first um and uh yeah i'm so i read tons of fantasy and science fiction growing up um later learned i have adhd so probably hyper fixated on that a lot as an escape good times um and i'm also i'm I'm going to call myself a writer because I do write things, but I've never published. So, but I do like the, the world building aspect of, of games and books and stuff like that. So. Nice. All right. Let's pass over finally to Amy. Hi, I'm Amy. I use she, her, they, them pronouns, and you can find me at on Twitch at paradoxical ghoul. Um, and that's me in the chat there. And uh, so I don't write stuff necessarily. I more come up with ideas and then pitch them to a friend and go like, wouldn't this be so cool? And then they just go like, yes, yes, Amy. Yes, it's very Usually cool. Usually they're, they're Amy's dreams. Sometimes they're my dreams. Sometimes they're not. Sometimes I'm just like, oh, hey, what about this really absurd thing? Or like, what about this totally mundane thing in a fantasy setting? Like, wouldn't that be so, why not? Why not? Why does it have to be over the top extravagant? Why can't it be just like boring mundane stuff? That could be cool too. Let's explore that. Um, so yeah, I like coming up with world stuff. Yeah, it's it's a it's a thing. Hi. Nice. All right, so folks, today we're going to talk about world building. So if you have any questions for how to do world, any world building in your own campaign, you can or, or chronicle if that's what you're going to call it, or story in general. Uh, go ahead and put it in the chat there, and we'll get to it eventually. But I think that we should all kind of go around uh, and let's do this popcorn style. Uh, show of hands if you want, if you have something to add to it. And I think that uh, let's define what world building is. So obviously world building is the creation of a world, but where do you start with that? What does that mean? So world building does not have to be, uh, just the quick parameters, does not have to be um, creating an entire unique construct uh, of a universe. 
right? Uh, it does not have to be creating every tiny bit of minutia. It can be as simple as magical realism or changing, you know, a couple of things in modern day, you know. Um, world building is just as valid in uh, in Hyrule as it is at Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters, right? So, um, yeah. Does anybody have anything to add? Yeah, Tosh. You are very silent, so, um, Tasha. Is that better? That's yes. yeah. Okay. Um, I think especially for RPGs, world building can also be about defining the limited corner of your world. So even if it's a like a our world, um, but like defining exactly what the parameters of that are for the RPG, kind of where does that end? What types of like people stories are we talking about and that kind of stuff instead of just building from scratch, narrowing it down. Yeah, I, nice. I would agree with that because um, at least in my opinion, um, it's better to take that narrowed down view and do it well and, and like really develop that part of it. And then if you want to expand from there, you can, but at least then you have a base. All right. That sounds really good. So uh, Rob. I was just going to say like world building can be something as small as doing little like the second you pick up a, a module from somewhere and are going to run it for a table, that is your world. It may have been based by other people that have helped create it, but you're still going to run it and you can still make choices of how your world is going to be presented to your table or to your group or to your audience. It's it can start big. You don't have to. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to start uh write write your own language and then write a book about your your the language you made up like uh tolkien did just tolkien yeah you, you do not have to be tolkien and don't ever actually that is one of the things that i said when i used to teach this is i said like don't think you have to be tolkien to build a good world uh mike i think one of the best ways to start with world building is uh make your ideas reality whether it's you record it as an audio idea, like speak into a voice recorder, whether you write it down, whether you sketch it, whether you draw it. If you can't do any of the above, uh, you know, enter it into a Word document on your computer or find a friend with the ability to do any of that stuff and say, hey, I have an idea. Can you help me with, you know, making this reality become real? And nice. they can give you kind of the, the seeds of your idea. And from there, you can make it grow. I've had many people come into my work with stuff scribbled on the back of a napkin saying, I want to do this. And from that point, you can create a lot of things. But when it's an idea still floating in your head, it becomes difficult and kind of muddy to get that idea out into the world. So get that idea out however you can. Just have a means of expression and express it and give it to people who can take that idea and make it go further. Nice. Okay, so um, let's look for starting places right now. So in my humble opinion, there are two places that you can start to do world building. Number one, there is the, the full iceberg approach where you are creating a world from scratch. You need to know every single thing about it before your characters enter play. You need to know the entire world, the political system, the history, all of that. A lot of authors, writers, and game masters get really hung up on that because they need the entire thing. They need to do the Tolkien-style language creation to be able to understand that elves do this. Um, that is a style that people can do. I personally think that it is full of booby traps. Um, my preferred method and my suggestion to all of you when you are building your own world setting is start small. Like, like Mike's saying, get something you can put out in the world. Start small with a single thing. Like, you want a world. Let, let's, let's, as we're going through this, we have an hour to do this. So let's, as we're talking, maybe idly throw an idea for a world in the background. So what's an idea for a world that would be a unique setting for a role-playing game? Let's say D&D &D just because it's easier that way for everybody. All vehicles um, are powered by fish. Okay, so we're, we're in, um, powered I mean, by I fish. Was... I was just going to say underwater, so... <laughs> we're, okay, we're powered, are we talking about powered by fish, or are we talking about, like, whale oil? Well, this is powered the start of an idea, so, I mean, you take the idea and you run with it. No, my first, my first immediate thought was a vehicle with a fish tank, and the fish swimming around, the kinetic energy or whatever nonsense like, is like what powers... Wheel. Yes, yeah, no, it's a hamster wheel, point. but it's How the hell did we get I'm here already? That. This is usually step three. Uh, this is okay. where I'm starting. Okay, so so there we go. We've got three ideas that are that are immediately. We want something with with fish. We want something uh, uh, potentially aquatic. 
Um, and okay, so maybe so we're doing a water world setting. Okay, uh, that sounds fine. We got Call of the Nether Deep on the channel. Um, that works out pretty well. Okay, so then you have to start thinking about a couple of basic things. What would we need to know to build a world that was aquatic? Step one: Can characters do what? Breathe. 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 Okay. So are we dealing with people with gills or are we dealing with people that are inside of like vacuum containers and, and like bubble cities or using magical breathing apparatus and things? Or What's cool? Exactly. Who's the populace? Of... Are these humans? Are they yeah. not humans? Who are Are they? we just hand waving it and being like, it's fine. Or are Don't we ask. doing the Sponge SpongeBob SquarePants thing where you have mostly those who can breathe underwater, but then you have the one yeah. or two people one who are two in, people that, you know. Yeah. yeah, true. Well, I don't know. Let's pick something. Like, I think the, the, one of the best things about world building is you should always, uh, you should always make decisions in pencil. Mm. Yeah. Um, it is absolutely fine to say something and change your opinion later. Uh, if you look at our homebrew setting of Elos, uh, it is a kind of a reverse engineered fantasy setting. And in it, um, it is eventually revealed inside of the main campaign that humans aren't from the planet. Love. They were from an they were from a parallel world. Now, that doesn't mean that humans weren't there. There's trade and migration and all that stuff. Uh, but that's something that's like, yeah, no, that was lost to history. People don't remember it. Yeah, Even the humans, elves don't remember. Humans are an invasive species. We are. We're, well, humans, uh, no, humans are refugees. That's true. Humans are refugees. Elves, elves are the invasive, are the invasive species. Because yeah. elves are dicks. Yeah. You heard it here first, folks. Elves are dicks and orcs are peaceful. I love them. Orcs are so good. Orcs are, when you're doing world building, I'm just going to put this out here, uh, decolonizing races like orcs is so much work good luck yeah we talked about that so much right at the beginning when we started our main campaign like it was like a full-time yeah. gig just trying to figure out how to make orcs not yeah yeah because i was playing an, an orc so it's like this is something we had to figure out very kind of early what we're gonna do so okay actually you know what let's bring that up then so all of y'all if we're building this setting um uh tip number two if you're building a role-playing setting and you want it to be better Talk to your players and have them help you build it. It sounds like there's a lot of worry that they will be spoiled or that they will, um, uh, that, that, that you, they'll lose the surprise or they'll taint it. You can always tell them no and be like, well, it's my setting. I kind of want to go this direction with it. Do we have anything like that? You can guide them gently, but that gives them investment. Uh, Amy, Mike. I think Mike was first. Oh, was Mike first? Okay. Well, this is essentially what they like to call in the real world a whiteboard meeting, where there are no bad ideas. Everyone just pitches stuff out, it gets written down, and then we readdress it once we kind of start solidifying ideas. So, you know, if you want to do good world building, write notes. Write lots of notes. Have other people look at it and give their ideas. There are no bad ideas. There is no bad input. Everything can be, like, written down at this point and then readdress afterwards. Mm -hmm. That's true. Amy? I was just saying that, like, just because, like, it doesn't spoil your players to know about the world their characters inhabit. Because well, they got to learn about it anyway. They're, they're going to learn about it anyway. How are you going to have an in-depth character background if you don't know about your background? It's like, going to help inspire them to create a character in the first place. Exactly. Like, we had conversations about orcs, which very much informed how I directed character development of my main care of my character mm. and, and, and for I those care of, a lot yeah and and so um in the chat there's a there's a comment by abyssal icarus that i think is is very interesting and it's no fantasy racism there there are dragons there the world doesn't need a racism uh and i think that yeah like so long as we're talking about like if we're talking about real world racism absolutely if we're talking about like race race feuding like fantasy race feuding lineage feuding um like elves and dwarves i think that there's like a difference there that that's more like a historical like it's almost like a family feud or like a like a um uh was the the mccoys and the um hatfield hatfield, hatfield. i was thinking hatchets and i was like hatchet McCoy. <laughs> um well, it's but, they wouldn't bury the hatchet Exactly. Well, and this is one of the problems, actually, um, just I'm just going to come out and admit this. I had a problem with this um, that I accidentally realized I was setting myself up for um, some things in Elos because I was like, oh, I want to do all like all of these different cultures and like kind of vibe checks around the around the world. Like there's this one like vaguely kind of like Babylonian Egyptian culture, like that type of like desert society. Right. 
But then the more I thought about it, I was like, oh, well, maybe there's like a the the biggest pitfall for any for <laughs> any developer is to say, well, is there like a like an Eastern inspired setting, like something like Japan, like kind of like with a Japanese vibe or like a Korean vibe. And then I got to thinking that, well, if humans are there, why the hell if all the humans are from another planet and they all are refugees here, they didn't all settle based on, you know, 200,000 years of, of evolution in a region, right? There, it's just as likely, because I would say things like, oh, yeah, the person looks like they're from this region of the planet. And then I realized it was bullshit, because if you're from Okoka, which is kind of like, it, it's our discount Wakanda, um, that doesn't mean that you are dark-skinned. It might mean you're very tan, because it's a very hot place. But to say that, like, all of the, the dark-skinned humans ended up in one place is really dumb and short-sighted. And I think I accidentally hand wave. I was like, oh, yeah, so it's like that. And then I actually thought about it for a second. I was like, that's really stupid, guys. And everyone was like, oh, yeah, it is really stupid. Change it. And I'm like, okay, it's changed. Um, Tasha. Um, I want to say two things. One, I think um, <coughs> on the topic of kind of including racism in your games, I think by mm. default, not including that is a good idea. But then sometimes that might be the story you want to talk about. Like maybe your story is about dealing with that. Um, and obviously making sure your players are okay with that before diving into such a story. Um, but it might be what you're trying to do. And second, be really careful if you're including characters, a race that is eat evil race. Like, does it need to be? Like, is that really the kind of thing you're creating? Is that need to be in the world? What does that mean? Like, what does that look like? And what kind of characters are in this race? Why are they evil? Like. It's a very slippery slope, kind of dangerous territory. Mm, yeah, just to mm. kind of continue, it's like maybe, maybe vibe check your your stereotypes if you're mm. trying to have an evil character. Don't be like, oh, that's such a good point. Them. Also, yeah, if you have an evil race and it has to be for whatever plot reasons, oh my god, what traits does that race have? Be careful. Be careful. Well, that's be one of the things. Like, like orcs end up as an allegory for a lot of really horrible things. Um, and it's really hard that we, we had to work really hard to sidestep that. And it, it's difficult, right? It, yeah. it, because you can really get a lot of horrible things in your in your fiction that way. And sometimes you don't realize you're doing it until you go like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. What have I done? And you have to kind of. Well, because so much of our cultural references do that. And so you're just like, that's what everyone does. And then you're like, wait a minute. And, and yes, Iron Warrior, you're right. Uh, Wizards has been trying to remove base alignment from races so that like all drow are not evil it's um i and, and they haven't been really doing the, there's like a lot of like negging on forums about it like oh wizards is trying to do this you know what wizards is really doing if you look at the new books they say typically in front of it and a lot of people are upset about this because they're saying oh they're they're changing the game it's like well no like drow are typically evil they're they're, they're a slave trading society who worships an uh, an evil spider goddess? Okay, yeah, that's typically, but that doesn't mean they can't be good ones, right? Um, which obviously, this is not the panel to start talking about the the one good drow type of type of discussion there. But um, it's it's really difficult to to do that type of balance. We talked about this in another panel, uh, whether or not um, you could actually have a race uh, of beings where they're core cultural tenants are evil and then not call them evil like you know if a race is based around enslavement of other sentient beings they evil sorry uh robin michael well i think the thing is um with like a fantasy setting is 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 that yes it's a world and yes they're creating these like having these races and but at the core of the day, fantasy is generally like a good versus evil story. So to prepare people, you need to sometimes have an antagonist. And the easiest way for I'm sure I'm guessing writers when they make a, a uh like a, a module or a story is to have, you know, an easy way is the good versus the bad, who are the good guys, who are the bad guys. And I, so I think that's where they probably started. And yes, now we're kind of doing the typically, because hey, what if you want to have a, a, you know, there's the Duragar who are dwarves and they're- You know what? There are never any Duragar good guys. Yeah, right? We've got tons of drow good guys because drow are sexy. 
right? But Durgar, you know, <laughs> they're not need... sexy. They're not. But sexy. I think like it. It just no depends on your your story. Cause it's really fantasy at the at the end, I think, is that kind of the the humanism of us wanting to be good and save the world is kind of I think like the core of what I think of fantasy worlds is is that wanting to be a hero kind of aspect and so i think it's it's an interesting thing about racism and i do agree with uh, abyssal icarus later saying like oh it's more about the uh just talking about more orcs or savage which i yeah totally get rid of those racist tropes you can still have like the drow being your evil race because they're slavers because that is bad but yes having your typical races yeah maybe change things up in your in your world elves are elves are you know like a uh, nad pod with the crook elves being not halfalutin you know they're not highfalutin all right so uh which which order was this was this mike then tasha i think it was so to kind of pull this back around uh with our original idea of like vehicles being powered by fish what happens if your characters suddenly become freedom fighters against the oppressive uh corporation that has forced fish into uh <clears throat> becoming fuel for all the vehicles of the world and your characters are now those that are trying to put an end to that sort of level of tyranny and free the fish. Okay, I mean, let's make the you, fish more... You, let, let's make the fish you, cooler first, though. Yeah, well, you can take, like, these basic ideas and, like, scale them up. And you can also scale them down to scale. microscopic levels know, where it's, like... I was going to say indivi <laughs> indivi Individual ideas of how these simple ideas that affect the entire world affect individual people and entire cultures. So, okay, you so... know, every basic idea can be scaled in every direction, using that word again. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a good hook to start with. Um, but before we're finished, um, Tasha. Sorry. I, just I didn't mean to keep to you on, on the line there. I just wanted to say that, um, like, I think the idea of making a race, racial culture into an evil idea like slavery or whatever is, like, a really good way to do it because just because mm. your culture is that way and you were brought up that way doesn't mean you necessarily agree. So you, it opens the door for individual characters to be whatever. That's true. Cultures can be evil. People can be good. Like people can change cultures have are much more resistant to that. So uh, I'm going to, I'm going to say, how about for the backstory? They're ma only magic fish can power these, these vehicles and, and things, but there may be like fish that are like the souls of the dead. So like when someone dies, they turn into a fish. My brain that's kind of dope. Went, my brain also just went what if what if what if powering what? vehicles is a union job for the fish <laughs> okay <laughs> so, okay, so is it the is it the fish union like or the employed? ghost fish union see that's the that's question fish union. That's, but like they've this chosen the to do dystopia. it because it's a good job dystopia. Fish -topia. <laughs> it's so it's I'm either suddenly, fu or the gfu <laughs> i'm suddenly remembering that one episode of bojack that's entirely under the ocean. Oh my gosh, I did not. I had a, I was like ha cooking dinner and I got so confused by that episode I had to rewatch it. Yeah, it was a like... hell of an episode. It was a hell of a And there's the whole like, what do you mean you couldn't talk? The buttons there. That was so good. It was so, oh, good. so good. Um Ghostfish Union. All right, there's a Ghostfish Union. So apparently all ideas are valid. Okay. Uh, so uh, when you're thinking about that, start thinking about uh, uh, problems and other things that can arise as well, right? So um, do we want people to be able to breathe underwater or do the ghost fish, I mean, if the ghost fish power these vehicles and are the ones who can like perpetuate life support systems and things. They breathe magic bubbles that you can wear over your head that provide oxygen. Okay. All right. So, so that means that we have to breathe oxygen. So we got, we can do, we can officially go. Uh, standard fantasy races uh, now if we're using standard fantasy races and lineage that means in my opinion that tritons and koatoa have an innate advantage and so do water genasi makes sense yeah so yeah. if you look at this you think what you got to do is when you look at a setting look at who has the innate advantages and basically look for the privilege because it shows up if you have inherited wealth and that wealth is air like, we can literally be in a society here. We live in a society where fish control the air, and air is currency. Amy. So space balls. Space balls! Okay, so... Oh, look out! What about, I don't know, effects of 
who controls the fish industry. Is there a capitalism kind of thing going on here? Do we have someone who really who wants to get more fish for a profit? <laughs> fat, fat fishistic? <laughs> is it a is it fishism? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. The important so better red is there fish someone than dead fish. going better around fish than red fish. killing magical fish that breathe the air for the oxygen or whatever? Is it the ma- the dead fish that breathe ox- the thing, or is it the the magic fish breathe oxygen and then they're dead fish? The the fish. Well, you know what? Let's union. let's let's back well, off the, the let's back off the spirits of the dead bit. Okay. And for how now. did this get started? Like, was it started as a capitalist? like th- something someone sold like this or someone invented it or was it just like something that's kind of developed like naturally or is it a or... symbiotic relationship that started initially what did we have something that the fish needed and they're like fine we'll give you our air bubbles we'll fart on you and you can so I was okay. a little bit worried there that we were the... gonna have someone going around like causing deaths or whatever to facilitate more of the thing to create well that definitely changes tone there what were you saying jen just that paradox talks in in the chat was less like just like oxygen at a price that's true you can have cans of oxygen so if we're having like cans of oxygen so and we've got vehicles and we've got fish underwater i think what we're leaning toward is an industrial era society yeah, because probably with it, some sort of immigration from maybe the uh, land surface for so to let people to okay underwater. probably forced immigration because then the fish are a requirement not just a a be- well it, at the very least we have to be far enough from land that it's it's deadly or inconvenient to lose these fish yes right yes. because there needs to be some steaks uh, some some tuna steaks um, and uh, so here's the question aesthetically now when you think about world building think about aesthetics. It, it may seem shallow to do this because you think, oh, well, that's just, you know, for art and things like that. The artist will glare at you, first of all. Uh, but number two, thinking of the aesthetics of something can help you define the parameters of what you're thinking of. Because right now, we have a choice. We can look at this and think of this as uh, Dishonored, the video game. We could draw from Bioshock for this. We could draw from the Snorks or Spongebob Squarepants. Like, there are so many different motifs and different aesthetics that we can draw from. So right now, I want to ask, okay, there are two ways that I'm thinking right now that you can do the currency of air, just off the top of my head. What Uh, Kelly is saying is there are no new ideas. Look at other people's ideas and then adapt those to your own. That is one thing I am saying, yes. Always, Always steal and repurpose remix culture is storytelling period look at star wars it is three different things it is that's, that's Kira why there's, Kurosawa. there's a certain point when uh when like copyright and stuff kicks in but you can mm. definitely still use ideas <laughs> uh what does it change 30 percent minimum 30 um, percent yeah probably something like that um well, in terms of like, idea of like don't yeah. steal a bike from the town you're in right like where you're gonna ride it or whatever i don't know the quote but if you transition something into a different type of field or media or genre or something now you're remixing it and it's different yeah, and yeah par- like, parodies and um uh, homage and yeah and homages they're, they're fine Fair use. um and then if you're like just because i feel like adding this when you're actually like copying things, it's usually ten percent or a chapter of a book, <laughs> whichever so, is smaller. When you're when you're looking at this stuff, though, like I mean, honestly, be honest with yourself. The Mandalorian's a western. It is literally, it is one part: the good, the bad, the ugly, Unforgiven, and a couple of other westerns. And then the rest of it is Lone Wolf and Cub, the samurai TV show slash manga. Like that is the entire show. And they're like, also, it's Star Wars, and it works space right? western. Love that. it's a space western like that is literally what it is it is the, yeah. you you do not even like if you go back and watch a new hope and then go watch the the last fort or the the lost the, lost, the hidden fortress by akira kurosawa same movie yeah um that brings up a great point of mixing genres do that <laughs> it's great <laughs> so um i went to school for writing i actually i have my bfa in writing and I went to a snooty university that would not allow you to write genre. Like you, if you wrote genre fiction, you were looked down upon, you're, you would get worse grades, you're, and in some classes, the professor would actually restrict it. You could not write genre fiction. And through that experience, I learned one thing, and that is genre fiction 
they were the professors that I had were half right because a good piece of fiction and a good world should be able to function with with the genre stripped. If you can take away what makes it like if you took Lord of the Rings and said it's Lord of the Rings, but it's actually a World War II movie and there's no magic. Genre it still works. Really just window dressing on the story. Yeah. Right? Everything. Yeah. Everything. You, if you can boil it down, the story is the most important. Window dressing. Absolutely. Robin, you had something to, to say to this. Yeah, it was just like, because we're talking about like building a world from scratch too. Um, I just want to just quickly throw out there too. There are great tools if you're a bit, if you're not a professional writer and you are um, like worried, there are like, I found a really cool tool was the the quiet year that Krista ran for Extra Life that basically did a world building that we did and created a whole world that we then played in. And that helped us as players invest in the story and i thought it was a really great way that you can do if you don't want to do this kind of world building that we're doing there are tools that you could potentially play and then transfer that over into your like D setting or world of darkness setting or however you want to do it's a it's just a you know there's lots of stuff that you could potentially do if you don't want to start off like this and start off with an idea and build from that there are other tools out there for non-professional people um I, I had formal training so if you That's google cool. the quiet year um it is the first game that is there it costs you a couple bucks to buy it it's actually absolutely phenomenal and you can play it by yourself or with friends i think just get it just absolutely get it uh, the one though so on aesthetics real quick so what, what i want to do is i want to talk about aesthetics for about 10 minutes and then let's talk about tips tricks and other ways that you can cheat at world building like the dice map generation because that's my favorite, guys. And I'm a professional writer. I love generators because generators are a coin toss. And what I mean by that is that if you ever have a choice between two things, commit to one of them being heads or tails and flip a coin. This, before the coin hits the ground, you'll know what you actually want. Because you'll, re, you'll flip it again if you hate it or you'll want to. Right? And when I use a generator and it goes, okay, I need an elf name. Blendle Bob Bristleback? That's a really dumb name. Okay, but I kind of like parts of it. And then you can remix it into what you want, right? So that was a bad example of a name. So uh, aesthetics. So in this ghost fish world, um, air is a commodity. So I'm thinking it, it can exist in three ways. We'll, we'll define the aesthetics of our world. Uh, number one, uh, does it come in little gems and beads that you go kind of like Tic Tacs or something like that? And that is how the air is stored in tiny, tiny gems. Number two, is it in a can? Is air canned? If so, then there must be industrialization and canning. There also must be a supply of tin, iron, or something like that to make the and cans. And a way to dispose of it. Bing! Is there a recycling center? Right? Uh, or three, do you use leather or skin or animal bladders to do it? With little like like uh, popping from the uh, from the top of an airline mask bits. Like, <gasps> I'm totally envisioning like puffer fish. <laughs> okay, there's a there's a fourth option. <laughs> I like so the, are they, are they... I like the idea of using the cans, but since you're already underwater, it's the reverse. You're actually popping it for the fizz, not the liquid. Yeah. Mm. But what if you just shake up a puffer fish and it starts frothing at the mouth? <laughs> the best of maybe you have to insert a can into a puffer fish to filter it. <laughs> um, back to the the like animal bladders and stuff. Where are those animals coming from if you're using that? That's fair. Are they are they like stitched out or something like that? Um, like there's a lot of ways. So it's sort of thinking about things that will complicate the setting. And um, I, I think that with world building, you should make sure no easy victories. That's not to say that you should make sure that every day is awful for your cast because the the worst thing you can do in games, particularly like games where there is like a certain element of darkness, is make it like every day sucks 100%. Nobody would live there. There has to be just enough hope to keep you going. Like the factory workers have to pull 15 hour days, but they get one day off a month where there's free beer and donuts. And mm. that's enough. And they, you know, maybe they have families and things like that. But like, um, it seems seems cruel, poor puffer fish. Well, yeah, that's the point. This is a bad society that is it's it's we're setting up a capitalism revolt. Um, okay, let's talk about some tricks. 
unless anybody has um, anything else to add actually, to this. Actually, before we go into yeah. that, I just want to add one last thing to that. Um, much like don't make everything bad, don't make everything good either. There's good and bad in the world, right? There's nothing as boring as somebody who wants everything to be shiny happy all the time in a role-playing game. Like, that that experience for me... And that means, like, I don't mean that, like, not everything has to be, like, awful or anything like that. But they want, like, no conflict at all in a game. And that's there's no story there. Yeah. Um, you need some conflict, even if it is internal conflict of who you're going to ask out to prom. Like, there, there has to be something to achieve. So give some sort. Exactly, right? The story is built on conflict. That's mm. that's just it. And okay. our box. Everything evil is set upon the world, but what remains is hope. Yep. So there are a ton of different ways to... So maps are a great place to start world building, first of all. Uh, let's drop some of our favorite map builders. Um, so uh, Incarnate is a really good one. Um, let's pop that in the chat right now. There is uh, a dice-based one. Let me see if I can find the right one. But basically, you grab a bunch of dice, you drop them on a table, and whatever dice, like, I mean, like a pound of dice, you just drop them. Then you outline them, and uh, that is the shape of your land mass or undersea mass. And then you look and you say, okay, that D, that's a D12. And then you look at a, at, a, at a chart you've made. A D12 on a 7 is a town. Okay, there's a town there. And right, Amy? Yeah. And if you don't have that many dice, what you can do is get a bunch of macaroni and dump that on the thing and then go with, if you have, and then use your dice then to roll out the various features, uh, if there's dangers in this area, relics, ruins, etc. And you can figure it from there. Nice. Mm. Um, that is, uh, so we actually have a version of this in our Discord, if you want to go see it. It's like in our tabletop RPGs section, I think. It's way up there. As I said, there are resources and assets. I'm not, I can't remember. Yeah, okay. and Traz has been going through and Rand have both have been pinning things. Um, so I actually just dropped the incarnate a link in the Discord as well. So um, you can find that there. So someone, I, I don't, this is not the original poster that did this, but if you go mm -hmm. and uh, look at that YouTube video that I just posted, there is a um, someone who does a very similar version of what I was talking about, or a, like a smaller scale one. I get big screw off like um, like uh, conference paper, like the, the four by three size ones. So like, those are great. They take up a lot of space, though. Don't do that to for, yourself. For map stuff, too, you can use the old um, uh, fantasy novel trick of taking our map and just doing weird things to the land masses. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, if you're doing a fantasy world as well, don't get hung up on things like, well, but shouldn't a mountain be there? Or why doesn't this land mass work this way? Magic. Yeah. Come true. up with a reason why not. Also, names for air places. Yep. Don't get hung up on names. You could be like, this place is called, like, Something Falls. And that place could be called Something Falls. Because two different groups went like, there's waterfalls. We're going to call it Falls something. Do you know yeah. why Canada's called Canada? Canada, what was it? Is the word for village? Yeah. In the in the local culture of the indigenous people where the settlers came and were yeah. like, hey, what's this place? And like, Canada? Village. And they're like, it's <laughs> the village right there, bro. It's like, ah, oh, this is Canada. I feel like that happened with, like, how kangaroos got named or something. Well, and like, so and like, also, like, I don't just, know what, like, I don't understand or something. I, I could be mistaken, but it was like, something towns, like that. there's Ken, many like, Sydneys yeah. and like, there's Paris, Ontario. There America is. was named after a dude. Yeah. Right? Um, like, yeah. The, the fun thing about, about, uh, places being like named after other places. So Paris, Ontario is that there used to be like a Berlin, Ontario. And they're like, no, no. After World War II. Nope. Nope. <laughs> Change the name. <laughs> Yeah, there. When I was um, when I was running Scion for y'all, I I had you on a road trip, and I was really trying to have you go through a town. Each of you go to a town that was named after your local mythology. Like you went to Athens, Georgia, yeah. um, uh, and then somebody else went to um, just all of these. And I had so uh, Christine's character was from like the Japanese pantheon. You, there is one town in all of America that is called Noedo, which literally just means Edo, like old Tokyo. And it was, it was impossible. It's the size of a postage stamp, the town. It's ridiculous. There are like five people living in it, but we went there, damn it. Yeah. We I did there. not even notice that, that you did that. That's cool. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, um, it was really easy with places like Philadelphia, right? Like, mm, okay, yeah. fine. But yeah, and and you'll also get, you know, you'll get the Portland, Maine and the Portland, Oregon type yep. deal. Or all right? the different Where, Sydney's. Yeah. Sydney right. spelled like six different ways. Fort St. John, St. John's, St. Yep. There's whatever. Vancouver. There's three of them. There's <laughs> Vancouver, BC, Vancouver, Washington. Yeah. And named uh, after a person. So yeah. Oregon yeah. was almost named Jefferson. Yep. So that's a thing. I do feel like we're kind of getting off track here. Though. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, it's just naming stuff, right? Like, um, and, and finally Avon or River. Or the number of places in the world. Um, if you really want to go in depth and you've had multiple layers of settlement over a place, uh, violent or not, it could just be that like people migrated out of a region if you want to keep that out of your games. Um, the Sahara Desert is is a culture clash name, right? So Sahara means desert and we called it the desert. There's one place in the world that has the same name three times and I forget what it is. It's it's like it's the... It's a hill in England. It's, um, it's, it's the hill, that... hill, hill. It's the hill, hill, hill. Yeah. It's Torpen Hill, something like that. I thought it started with a P. Look up, look up. Yeah, the, so your city has an Avon Torpen, River. Yeah. Torpen Howe Hill. I, I wrote Hill, Hill, Hill in, in Google. <laughs> Torpen uh, so Howe Hill. Fu fun, funny story about Springfield. Um, I actually grew up in Missouri where there was a Springfield. We had a Springfield. That was like the, lo the closest mall to me. And um, I was flying my girlfriend, uh, my high school girlfriend, into in to see me. And I accidentally sent her to the wrong Springfield. Uh, we didn't find out until like sh she was on her way to her connection flight to get to Springfield, Oof. and that was me having to. It was we 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 were wondering why the plane tickets were so cheap, but we didn't realize because I was like seventeen or eighteen at the time, right? I was dumb, but uh, that was a quick four hundred dollar loan from my parents to get that fixed. Uh, by the way, it's four hills. Four Tor, hills. Tor, Penn, and How all mean hill. Uh, old English, hill. Old Welsh, Old Norse, respectively, um, and then oh Hill for English. God. That's fantastic. Yeah. I play No Man's Sky, and I forget how many uh, worlds and stuff are in that, in the close to a billion of them within the game. And mm. pretty much every planet, every star system is randomly named using some general rules. And I have literally played in that game and gone to worlds that have like 16 consonants randomly banged together. And you look at it and you're like, how do I even pronounce that? And there's always the option to rename it because, you know, you're the first person to ever land there. You can call it whatever you like that makes sense. And I almost never do because I like going back and trying to rename or I would never even consider renaming whoever originally named this place, you know, 16 consonants. And I don't think I ever pronounce it the same way twice. And you, if, you if you're making Welsh. a fantasy world, do that. Yeah, just That's look great. at Welsh. Yeah, it's look, just, basically a fantasy language. It's it's yeah, it really is. Uh, another thing that you can do if you're looking for a quick generator is, uh, and you own a copy of Civilization or Alpha Centauri, just boot it up and like do a screenshot. It'll 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 create a landmass for you, and it'll populate it with enemy territories that you can just screen cap once you get killed by them. True. Yeah. Um, so what other, do we have any world building questions like in the chat? Is there any other place that, um, uh, or any other, other tools that y'all use for world building or anything like that? Um, oh, write stuff down, write stuff down, write stuff down. Mike was saying write stuff down for your edification. Uh, use something like OneNote or Google Drive to like take notes. Spreadsheets are your friends, guys. They really are. Also Google Translate if you're like looking up for cool names, like throw a... You know, throw in... I use Welsh and, and Serbian a lot. So this is my binder full of all the games that I've made since, like, my teenage years. This is full of so many ideas that I haven't touched in years. And actually, I, I pulled it off the It looks the like the book from the first Lord of the Rings inside of the Mines of Moria. Oh, essentially, essentially. Some of the stuff in here, actually, I, one of them actually has the date on here is 1989. So I don't know if uh, any of you were around when I was writing stuff like this, but uh, it's full of all sorts of great ideas. I would like to go through this and like revisit it and see what my brain was thinking years ago and see if any of the ideas hold up, see if any of the thoughts like can, you know, generate new ideas. <clears throat> but always write your stuff down, put it somewhere, like keep it as a treasure keep it as a as, as your as your Secret. history 
and you can oh. revisit you can revisit it whenever you like and you can add to it and you can change it so it this belongs to you so do that uh also... and if in doubt it becomes a good home defense weapon <laughs> absolutely so also... i have killed bugs uh wadaboo at itch.io has a medieval city generator that i really love if you just need a quick map of a city um it's pretty fantastic oh so and you can constantly customize and drag and drop and change it it's, it's really it's great so like you can just completely rebuild that i had some base ideas for like um uh when we were doing uh secret of hexeter house for port of kidna I have also, some... I see you, Traz, um, pinning everything that I'm putting in the Discord. I appreciate you. I see you, baby, pinning that stuff. Uh, yeah, and then uh, Asgar, Asgar.github, really good as well. Really solid. Um, yeah, so, and then, so, what other, what other world-building stuff should we talk about? Oh, thank you, Traz, for finding the map generation. Go to our Discord. Join our Discord. You can find... Uh, so I updated the one that I found on Imgur originally. Uh, and of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Basilic Chris Fantasy Name Generator out the wazoo. Uh, I also would suggest um, a great place to go if you're looking for seed ideas is going to D&D &D Speak because they've got tons of like 100 item lists where it's like 100 cataclysmic events. Uh, yeah. Tasha. I just posted a couple links um, for things like um, how are you building your religion for this world? Like what kind of religions are there? And things like what kind of cultures? Like are there lots of different cultures? Like how do they interact? What kind of politics are going on? All that sort of stuff. I love the culture building side of it. Like I especially like getting like seeds for like legends and lore that may have been passed around. And maybe there's variations in different parts of the world. Like maybe you have... Like, if you have two characters in a game and they both know different versions of the same myth, that's rad. Or, like, and also, if you... what's changed over time? Like, yeah. how has that myth evolved? How have the histories evolved? Like, what countries used to be at war but aren't anymore? Because fantasy often gets into this thing. It's like, these two countries have always been at war. And it's like, okay, but like, in that's... reality, maybe those countries were once part of each other or they had different borders entirely. Like, what's the history? Yeah. And then you get things like the potential for, like, for, like, regional variation in names of gods if you sh if they share a religion do they call it the same thing um we do that in the shards of dern where and in our our homebrew world where like um one of our pa our, was it is it the three sisters the or the, the three sisters the the uh, the um the shasa yeah yeah um i think we first ran into it with the uh, with vela our god of the sky the sun and storms and etc mm -hmm. um I think it was Vela, and then we ran into a name, what was it, Amvila, I think was? Oh, um, um, Vela. Vela. Um, Vela. Yeah, it, so we ran and they were like, wait, who's that? It's like, oh no, it's the same, it's the same. Oh, oh, okay. We have a connection here. Interesting. Yeah, I, slightly I love different. that. Slightly, slightly more sun-focused than storm-focused, mm -hmm. but uh, like that's what you get with cultural deviation. I was thinking about what Tasha was saying a second ago and how you could actually write your culture myths in like really... What you could do is you could write on index cards or little post-it notes your culture myths, like like almost like fridge magnet poetry. Like, uh, so you come up with a god's name. So your god's name is Alfu. Okay, Alfu was good, fought monsters, created humans. And then come up with like a bunch of random words and then just roll a dice and move one of those words randomly out and then pop another one in. So <laughs> Alfu was bad, fought monsters. Oh, whose myth is this? You know? <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Or like synonyms. Play telephone like with yourself. The interpretation can shift. Be like, oh, blah, 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 blah. And then be like, okay, we're going to like put a synonym in because maybe there was a tra mistranslation. And you get some cool, might have some cool things there. Oh, yeah. Oh, or you synonyms. Yeah, absolutely you synonyms. Totally. I thought you said sins. No, sorry. Sins. I mean, you can use But sins remember too, but... sins as well because every culture has cultural taboos. Yep. And some of them might be, like, it might be, a, like, a punishable, scream-at-your-child-able offense to not recycle an underwater puffer fish can breathing place. Because we only have so many cans, guys. You know? Yeah. Yeah, and, um... There's a one point in the chat here going, like, does your world have clerics, etc.? Where 
uh, it was Abyssal Icarus, where does their power come from? Are there gods? Do they gods interact with the world? Also very good point. Like I think establishing that part is also very important because it can seriously impact how the, the culture mm -hmm. and views and everything. Oh, Tasha, you're muted. You got to unmute. I have no idea what you just said, Tash. I'm sure it was very elegant, though. Very eloquent. Are the gods like actual forces that interact with characters and the world, or are they just like concepts that people believe in? Hmm. Where did the gods get their power from? Is this like a belief-based system, or is it like, um, do they have um, mantles, or is it something just inherent in their being that they just exist? I... Do we know? Right. Well, once you start introducing things like divine power into a setting, you you start like segmenting off power. Because um, if you look at Final Fantasy, white magic, which technically is divine magic, but also it's controlled by mages. So mages control magic, right? Mm -hmm. So the gods in a lot of Final Fantasy games don't really factor in. But in, you know, if you have clerics, then there's a religious aspect to it. So who controls life and death? Who does that? Michael? Having just come from the sci-fi uh, panel... Um, a lot of this conversation about gods and stuff kind of stems back to uh, how, how is your world set up? Is it bigger than Earth? Is it smaller than Earth? If it's bigger, people are probably more, you know, beefy, maybe shorter. If it's like smaller than Earth, then maybe they're taller. Maybe they're not as strong. Uh, how many moons are there? Because a lot of religions and stuff are based on the suns, the moons. Are there more than one sun? Is, are there more than one moon? How do they interact mm. with each other? How does it affect things like the tide? How does it affect things like sunrise, sunset? If that's the case, does it affect the creatures of your planet and their migration? And does it affect seasons? I mean, a lot of the concepts of God stem from how your world like generally works. And if you, if you go to that kind of level and think about changes on your world, how does that affect, you know, the the economy of it how does it affect the society how does it affect all of the religions and on that note like you can totally go galaxy brain with this don't let that paralyze you you don't have to go that big if you're not ready for it scale back think about what affects your immediate life think about what affects your character's suburb okay and then expand out to the city and then and then, then like you know the principality and all that um so two quick questions red Muck, i think we can go through yours real quick what do you think about using things like medieval demographics to design towns sure do it yeah period done all good remember pigs will eat anything including your your kids so that is definitely a medieval demographic you should remember um but yeah totally look them up use them use every resource possible and cut corners because you don't got time for that um uh, iron warrior how does the presence of magic influence the demographics and advancements of your towns and cities uh super quick story because we only got 15 minutes left uh during writing school i was fortunate enough to uh, have a private one-on-one -on -one with steven erickson uh the author of uh, gardens of the moon and a bunch of other fantasy novels that were big in canada i don't know how big they are internationally uh and one of the things that he brought to his story and world and was very emphatic about talking about and this was back in like 2009 so this was kind of a big deal he was talking about um uh, gender equality in his fantasy setting and why he was like, yeah, women are not a lesser entity inside of this. And there's a, there's not really any sexism in this world, like traditional sexism, at least because women have magic too. And once physical size and power is not the be all end all. And it's like, yeah, you can knock someone around who's smaller than you, but they can light you on fire with their mind. That balances the scales a bit, and that changes the way that, that these dynamics work. Tosh. Uh, I love exploring that kind of stuff because then, like, does that lead into, like, okay, like, is this world have a completely different concept of how gender works? Like, are there matriarchies, like, more than patriarchies? Like, what's going on? Like, is there no gender difference? Do they just not care? Like... It just leads into all these interesting things you can do with it. Exactly, right? And like in our homebrew setting of Elos, like um like queer identity and 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 gender fluidity is pretty standard because we sat down and thought about it and we're like, well, it's a fantasy world, first of all, and we've got a bunch of players who really like to explore themselves and like are queer. So why should we why should we limit them, first of all? But number two, it's magic. And if I can resurrect someone from the dead. Can't I just be like, and you can use disguise self to change your form and you can use polymorph. Like these are things that exist. Shouldn't gender be really fluid if you can wake up one day and be like, hey, 
I think I want to try to live like if I woke up and said I want to try to live as a woman for a few years to see if it if, if it's right for me like yeah that should be super casual in this world and it shouldn't be taboo like except in societies where they're jerks and if you can have children that way because most of those taboos in our societies are because it limits the ability to have children right so that's historically why we get these kind of taboos yeah. if that doesn't exist anymore why would you have that taboo fair jen yeah. um i was just gonna add that i am a big fan of internal consistency in worlds that doesn't mean you know it has to be logical and real in our world just means that as long as there is a reasonable logical explanation in your world for something to be the way it is great but i'm also not a fan of just like it's like that because it is <laughs> right yeah absolutely we brought that up in the science fiction panel just throw enough gobbledygook at it and make it make sense it's almost like all of the panels are connected and it's all it's important like, you watch something all of like it that. it's right. like we ran this convention because we keep having these topics coming up and there's just so much to talk about that you mm -hmm. can't just yeah. involve your players and write stuff down and and internal consistency two things about the internal consistency internal consistency and external consistency and what i mean by external consistency is um when you run a world that you've built for players and it does not work with player interaction, that needs to bend to meet player expectation. Um, I'm not saying that like it has to conform to their their wants, but it has to conform to their needs as players. Yes. If you if you create a world and you're like, oh, well, women are totally second class citizens and everything's awful for them, like just a quick one, right? Or like all oh, this and all of your players are, are women or even one of your players is a woman that sucks that's not fun for anybody like you got to have their buy-in for that this is a gender panel but sorry um <laughs> our history panel we've gone on over that one a lot but yeah if, if you meet They're something like <laughs> it meets does somebody have something to add to that on external consistency like um well i mean a great example of it and this is more using rather than building your own world using the real world but our victorian mage game where you know we're all um at least female presenting even if um our pronouns aren't necessarily she her all the time um mm. and like you came to us with hey victorian age sucks for women how do you want to deal with this <laughs> right and, you know we we figured that out and you can do the same thing in a world you're building if the players aren't going to have fun with what you have. And yeah. the other thing is that the, I have, I've played in a lot of homebrew worlds. Mike said initially, write it down and get it out there. You know, what is the most frustrating experience is being a player in a homebrew world that you cannot reference or research. Now, yes, there are times where people have done a homebrew world and I have skimmed what they've given me. And I've been like, Ooh, this kind of sucks. Um, that happens. Uh, if it's your world and it sucks, do it again. You'll get better. Just keep practicing. But if you cannot provide people reference material and they, and they have to take your word on it every step of the way, that is really hard to feel invested as a player. Um, which is one of the reasons why I, I constantly try to keep like our religion wiki uh, updated for any godly stuff and we talk about it a lot and it is communal like everybody had a buy-in there and like i don't think there's a single player in the elos games uh like the regular like the big ones anyway who have i said like ah uh, yeah there's a temple of brig and most of you are like oh cool i can probably get beer there yeah you probably can or at least some food some bread yeah at a temple of brig the hospitality god totally there's food behind the the altar and I know it's going to be a great party if I go to a Temple of Basir. You won't remember it, but it'll be great. You'll, you'll end up with a lot of cool tattoos, though. Yeah. Basir has so many tattoos. <laughs> uh, your players have often ignored the prep handouts that you have put together. I mean, that, and that, but the thing is, um, that is their choice, unfortunately. Um, if... I mean, there are ways that you can do that. If it's that. important, it should be coming up in game anyways. I mean, I can see how that's really frustrating, though, when you when you do a setting package or do you do a prep handout and you hand it out and then you're like, all right. And of course, 
a man walks in, his cape flows in the breeze, and he says, My name is Horatio Hornswallow the Ninth. Pause for dramatic gas. Who's that? He's the king of the uh, did we meet him fucking before? country. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so like, because you've given out setting packages before, for especially for the World of Dawn and Chronicles uh, of Darkness. Uh, and I, I've had people not read them. Yeah. Yep. And and having that like, and this this might end up just being like a um, storyteller or DM uh, player mismatch, but if you have someone who's running the game who is super into world building and is like hey i gave you all this cool stuff to interact with and the players are like let's dungeon crawl and kick in doors and that's all we want to do it's hard <laughs> session zero session zero session yeah. zero like does your world can your world hold up to a party of murder hobos that well, and it's yeah I, I was just gonna say that even if you have a session zero even if you talk about it sometimes players don't realize that their play style isn't meshing well with or, or they lie running. because they want to be in a game yeah or that yeah which is it happens trust me it does yeah. it happens Tasha. it's frustrating everyone has to deal with it at some point in their life <laughs> mm -hmm. i think also on this note this comes back to kind of like understanding what kind of game you're trying to play as well like what kind of game do your players want like are you building kind of a comedic world where maybe there's less attention to like how well things actually would work logically or whether that makes sense or not or are you playing a really serious like dramatic heavy game where everything has to make sense everything should be consistent and that kind of stuff like or is it pretty fast and loose like uh, okay now I, this is happening yeah i love the idea of like a um like a disc world type humor setting where it's internally consistent but it like makes zero sense and you couldn't logic your way through it unless you literally grew up in that world. <laughs> so good. Right. I need to read more Discworld. I find Terry Pratchett's writing a little difficult for my ADD brain to, to grasp, though. He's a little too flippant for my... But that's another talk. <laughs> I started just, uh, listening to Color of Magic on Audible. and Does, does yeah. the audiobook help you with that? Um, yes and no. I I sent you a, a meme earlier where it was about I did. Podcasts I did. I agree. I can only listen to podcasts when I'm doing other things. And I'm the same with audiobooks as well. Except okay, so my maybe... hearing uh, hates me for that because then mm. my brain just goes off and I miss everything. Yeah, because I find reading Terry Pratchett is a lot like, you know, those like those bags of water that you squeeze and they go whoop. Yeah. That's not like reading. That's the experience. Like yes. The, very much yeah. so. Uh, but anyway, um, great writer, but yes, great, great writer, um, real a funny story about him. I'll tell you after the chat, uh, involving an old friend of ours. Um, he's a, he was a funny guy. We'll put it that way. Um, so, uh, what else we got about, uh, one minute before we got to do outros, any other final words about world building that you should do since this was a shorter panel water weenie. Thank you. That is actually what they're called. And that's weird. What? They're called, well, some places call them water weenies. It is true. I can see why. It makes sense. But, well, yeah. Yeah. Ha. thank you, but no ha. thank you. <laughs> I was thinking, right. well, I was talking about cultures and myths and legends. And I just, I keep coming back to this one idea of, like, legendary items and magical items. And how, like, in fantasy settings, they seem to be like, it's like oh, this is the, the ancient sword of so-and-so. There's a, a mural of him on the wall of this ancient fighter and this majestic sword that is blessed by the gods and so on and so forth. And you always know they're, like, over-the-top looking and, like, really, like, fancy. You're like, this is radiating. You know this is a magical item when you look at it. And I'm like, okay, but, but what if it's just a boring-ass sword and it's just really good? <laughs> right it's just like it's just really well made and they just rewrote it and like is and this like, a hankle it's like hearing like and because it's 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 like people are telling the story and like oh well i want to make a picture of this but i don't know what the sword looks like so i'm gonna make it up so no one knows what the hell this item actually looks like or something like, like that kind of stuff i love it I, I love it as an artist i do that every day <laughs> You, I, I try to make everyone look as good as possible because they're paying me as an artist to make them look as good as possible. Yeah, I mean, and that's fair. Like, that's great. And but that's that's the like Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade thing, right? Where it's like, well, which is the cup of Christ? And it's like, it's that plain wooden one. Exactly. Yep. Dude is supposed to be humble. Like, you're kind of you're kind of missing the point there if you think it was the jeweled one. But eh, you're a Nazi. Who cares? Yeah. Um. Or. <laughs> or <laughs> Or items that are like, oh, this was created by a god, or like it's a magical item, but it doesn't, it's like, 
Oh, it's just gloves that are always clean. Like, it's a magical item. But that's all it does is cast prestidigitation on itself. Also, like a like a, a throne of a dwarven god should be very small. Yeah, like... And, just, and stone. Like magical and items that are like, it's like, oh, a great power, and I'm just creating, like, regular everyday items with it. I'm just like... Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I guess be consistent. Let your ideas kind of flow naturally, and don't be afraid to change them after the fact. Like you, you haven't published yet. And here is the funny thing about uh, running in front of your players: uh, you can be wrong, and you can get parts of your setting wrong, and you can hand wave them away. Uh, and sometimes that can be part of the story, and they won't even know you're doing it. For example, like, oh, well, you thought that we were in a quaint New England village in the 1800s, but actually, it's 1999. Right. If you want to change settings, like if you start small and build outward, you can always be like, yeah, we thought that the world ended here at the edge of the trees. And we thought that, you know, all of these things were real. But in reality, you know, maybe the world isn't the way we thought it was. And you could be like, OK, so maybe the, the story and plot that you didn't love when you had a much better idea or your players had a much better idea is actually just around the corner. And you just need to leave this hometown that you started. Because who didn't come from an ass-backwards small town? Amy. That's about it. Amy didn't come from an ass-backwards small town. Maybe Michael. The rest of us I know did. So. I mean, depending on how you want to look at it. Yeah, fair. All right, so folks, let's go around in a big circle. Say who we are, where we've been, and where you can find us. Uh, let's start with you, Amy. Well, oh, hi, I'm Amy. Um... And uh, you can find me at, well, here on Dorktoils or at uh, twitch.tv slash paradoxical ghoul. Nice. All right, Jen. Video games. And I'm Jen, and uh, I just had to check that I was off mute, and I am great. I was at the gym today. That's where I came from. And where I am, you can find me is mostly on Dorktoils uh, when I'm less tired. <laughs> I know. We're all very sleepy, but it's, it's going to be fine. Uh, we'll survive. All right, Tasha. Hi, I'm Natasha. You can find me here on Twitch at Natasha Tuskovich Designs and all over the rest of the internet as well. Um, yeah, it was great to talk about world building today with everyone. I love um, stories and writing and all this stuff. So nice. thanks for joining me. All right, Mike. Uh, I've been Michael. And remember, dream big. And the bigger your dream is, the more you should be writing it down on paper. Because if you write your dreams down, you can make them reality. Don't let your dreams just be memes. So weird. All right. Uh, Robin. Hi, I I am Robin. And uh, you can find me over at Second Wind Gamer, but mostly here on Dark Tales. And yeah, just remember, again, I think I've said this almost every pa pa panel. Have fun. It's it's the, You're creating a world. Have fun with it. it it's, your, it's your world. And it's supposed to be a game. Yeah. Hmm. And I'm Kelly. This is Dork Tales. You know where to find me. Uh, with that, let's say goodbye, everybody, and uh, we'll see you soon. Come back for modules where we go through D&D modules and talk about all of that fun stuff. We'll see you in a second.